thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this session, and thank you so much, uh, Peter, for uh, the introduction and also the uh, uh, Antonio's uh, introduction to the special issues. Uh, I, I will not dwell with this session because that has been well covered by both Peter and, uh, and Antonio. Uh, but just a few words about uh, the salience of pre-colonial states, which is the focus on, on uh, the paper I will present. Uh, uh, it is a matter of fact, and you know that well, that Africa's pre-colonial states, they ceased to ex exist as political units a long time ago. Uh, and the kings and chiefs were co-opted uh, and subsumed by the colonial state. There seems to be some revitalization, revitalization in some countries now. Um, but these pre-colonial states, they left deeply held identities that also today structure political decision-making. And Marta Filbart has a really interesting book focusing on uh, West Africa, Senegal as a case, uh, documenting this. And um, in, uh, an inc uh, in, in uh, recent research, we also, uh, some very uh, uh, prestigious research also shows that pre-colonial centralization is found to be strongly correlated with development at both the national and local level. Uh, you are probably mo most familiar with uh, Michelopoulos and uh, Papineau's work from 2013 in uh, Econometrica. But the underlying mechanisms through which these pre-colonial institutions uh, affect long-run development still remain weakly understood. This is just a presentation, of, uh, a list of some of the recent work we did, just uh, to uh, uh, inform that this is, it's a very exciting work, but it's still work which uh, there are a lot of interesting things to do, both on colonial, uh, uh, the legacy of colonial powers and, and uh, the uh, pre-colonial uh, legacies. It's really exciting. And thank you so much, Antonio and uh, Kunal, for inviting me also to contribute to this special issue. This research is uh, funded by the Research Council of Norway. Um, the paper um, is published uh, this year, and uh, I will not dwell into the technicalities here, just guide you through our motivation, arguments, results, and possible uh, policy implications. So why Uganda? Well, Uganda has a long history of strong pre-colonial institutions, and they continue to play an important role in the lives of ordinary people. Um, and by focusing on one country, that allows us also to study or exploit within country variations in pre-colonial institutions which are not affected by national institution or the identity of the colonial rule, the British in this case. And as also has been an important uh, discussion point during the, this uh, conference is that low tax compliance continues to undermine domestic revenue mobilization in Uganda as well as in other, a number of other sub-Saharan African countries. Um, the pre-colonial organization in Uganda uh, was uh, implied both you have centralized areas, kingdoms, and more stateless societies. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the central and the southwest, there were central, uh, or centralized societies, kingdoms. The most famous one uh, is, of course, Buganda. But uh, there were a number of others. While in the north and, uh, and east, there were more or less stateless societies. Uh, no organized structure in the societies. So the motivation for this paper is to understand the core roots of, non, of tax compliance norms. And uh, the literature has provided uh, an array of theories and evidence attempting to explain these variations in citizens' tax compliance. Of course, f partly you, you, you're all familiar with the economic deterrent, deterrence theory, Alling and Sanmo. You have the fiscal exchange approach. You have issues related to 
to uh, fairness, trust in government, um, and so on. This is well documented in literature, and including the work uh, Mary Maali and I and Ingrid Schussen did in 2014, but Besley and others have done a lot of work on this. Um, these studies largely focus on the quality of institutions and social norms as key, impo uh, key determinants for tax compliance. But still, they do not provide adequate uh, explanations on the root causes of these variations in quality of institutions and, and uh, tax compliance norms that lead to these differences, both within uh, segments of the populations and between areas within countries. Um, taxation in, uh, in pre-colonial centralized kingdoms in Uganda was uh, uh, in quite a complex and well-developed uh, 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 issue. Uh, for instance, in uh, Uganda, there were four main taxes. Um, uh, just listed here, you can get more details in the paper. Uh, interesting, the number four, war exemption level were paid by men who did not want to participate in the war. Uh, generally, women and uh, unmarried men were exempted, and there were in-kind taxes and so on. The kings, they needed these tax revenues to pay for their armies, to support the royal court, and there were also frequent banquets, uh, and also to administrate the newly conquered areas. During colonization, um, British indirect rule maintained the autonomy of the chiefs in administri ad administrating the locals, including collecting taxes. And a quote from uh, uh, Harry Johnson, a, a special commissioner uh, in Uganda, for the, to, uh, he, he wrote a letter to uh, the colonial secretary of state in 1990. He said that the power to rule for the Baganda is closely connected with the power to tax. We must give them those snail subsidies, lest if we did not, this could cause a terrible uprising, the quelling of which would be very difficult to stop. So in the, in the kingdoms, taxation was a part, a key element of people's identity, feeling of identity, belonging to a state. So the objectives of the study is first to examine the legacy of pre-colonial centralization on tax compliance norms of citizens in contemporary Uganda. And here we compare pre-colonial centralized ethnic homelands and stateless ethnic homelands. And thereafter, we aim to analyze what are the underlying mechanisms. First, we examine the, whether the persistence in citizens' beliefs about the need to obey authority matters. Because in the centralized uh, areas or kingdoms, the state had an organized force to uphold its authority. Second, we examine the persistence in citizens' perception of trust in local institutions. Because the centralized states, they shape local institutions. They have a bureaucracy, a capacity to administrate the areas. And third, we examine the persistence of social cohesion or horizontal trust. The pre-colonial kingdoms were endowed with collective identities stretching across villages in their areas. Well, the data we use are firstly, we combine the geo-referenced anthropological data in pre-colonial ethnic homelands. It's the Murdoch 1959-1967, uh, uh, which is now also very much used in, in this type of studies, uh, historic, using, using the Murdoch uh, approach. And then we combine it with microsurvey data from several rounds of Afrobarometer su survey. We do uh, here rounds three, uh, six, three to six, three plus four plus five plus six, yes. And we use a regression discontinuity analysis in neighboring ethnic homelands with different levels of pre-colonial centralization. Here we, 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 we uh, uh, based this is based on, on or inspired by the work of Michelopoulos and uh, Papineau. 
So the empirical analysis here, well, the main dependent variable that measures tax compliance norm, we get that from the Afrobarometer survey. I think also, uh, 10 minutes, yeah. I think Marima also uh, used this question in, in, in your work. Uh, and there the respondents are asked to state whether they think tax evasion is, well, not wrong at all, wrong but understandable, wrong and punishable. And then we use a bin binary indicator set equal to one if the respondents choose a statement three and is set to zero otherwise, yes. And then we have to control for, uh, for individual uh, le uh, differences. We control for uh, age, gender, uh, whether people are residing in urban center, employment status, education, wealth, religion. And then we have a number of geographical controls at the level of ethnic homelands. For instance, distance to the center of each ethnic homeland, because institutional might be more influential uh, at, at the central level than in a more remote area. Uh, 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 capital city, whether people are residing in the capital city or other areas. A distance to nat national border. Uh, and so on. Land area, that has also to do with the, uh, the economic diversity. Uh, uh, we also control for pre-colonial and colonial ethnicity level variables, including the intensity of exposure to slave trade, which have, may have long-term effects on, on people's trust in each other's trust in, 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 in uh, the current uh, 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 authority. Um, we, uh, we control here for also pre-colonial economic development, dependence on agriculture, uh, and also colonial uh, 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 institutions like railway station, missionary stations, and so forth, which have impacts also on people's uh, relation to each other and trust in, in institutions. Uh, and there are also a number of other controls which you can uh, delve into when you read a paper. And the benchmark results. Um, here we have three columns, and uh, the first column, one, uh, there we control for a set of historical uh, ethnic homeland variables, uh, which includes exposure to slave trade, uh, indicator of pre-colonial uh, uh, economic uh, development, pre-colonial social organization, colonial investments, and so on. And then we, column two, that controls for ethnic fractionalization and individual perception about the treatment of their ethnic group. And then the fourth, the third column, sorry, includes an index for an individual's uh, perception of the quality of local service provision. And also we have night, uh, light den uh, density as, as a part of the variable here we look into. But in all columns, they include individual level controls like, uh, like uh, age, uh, uh, education, gender, religion, and so on. And the results show that pre-colonial centralization is associated with a higher tax compliance norm than the stateless uh, uh, areas in Uganda. And here we also do an RDI uh, uh, analysis where we say, is this, this is an average for each kingdom or can we find some differences? Does it depend on where people are located, close to the ethnic, to, to, the, to the borders of the state, between the stateless and, and uh, non-state, uh, between the stateless and the centralized areas? So we control for that and we find the same answer. This is, uh, we control also for 50, for, for respondents in the Afrobarometer living 50 kilometers from the, from the borders between the centralized and non-centralized states. 100 also, uh, same answer. This is reporting the, uh, the, the results from the respondents located 75 kilometers of the borders. And the same correlation between pre, there is a correlation between centralization and tax compliance norms. It remains positive 
and significant in all the columns. So, uh, what are the underlying me mechanisms explaining this? Uh, well, first, obedience to authority. In centralized uh, polities, the state had an organized force to uphold authority and can you, could uniformly apply policies throughout the given, given uh, territory. So, uh, in such a system, governance may then lead people to develop a culture of obedience to political authority. And here again, we use questions from the Afrobarometer survey. Uh, trust in tax authority, the courts, the police, the government. This is the question related to trust in tax authority um, from the Afrobarometer. The same, similar question when it comes to courts, police and government. And we find similar results here, that the individuals in the historically centralized parts of Uganda are more obedient to authority and the government in power than individuals in the historically non-centralized parts. Then we, we, uh, we examine the, the role of trust in institutions and tax because tax compliance cannot rely on coercion alone. Pre-colonial states could also encourage quasi-voluntary compliance through the accountability of leaders. And the persistence of accountable leaders in historically centralized areas, they may affect contemporary fiscal contract between citizens and the government by strengthening institutional trust. And we test this mechanism by looking into the relationship between pre-colonial centralization and individuals' trust towards the central government and also various institutions. This probably cannot be read there, on a, from down there, but uh, the results say people in the historically centralized parts of Uganda are less trusting of the state, the police, and the tax authority than the share of respondents in the historically stateless part. So although individuals in the historically centralized parts are more obedient to authority, it is not necessarily based on a trusting relationship. Then the third mechanism we look into is the social cohesion or horizontal trust. The pre-colonial kingdoms used different ways to bring together individuals with different backgrounds, clans, and make them acknowledge authority and also comply with the rules. So social cohesion among the different clans were also strengthened by means of religion, political ritual, rituals, and so on. And this helped very much to increase solidarity among the different clans and also created a co cohesive polity. So we test if this social cohesion, um, indicated by first ethnocentric national beliefs and, and second interpersonal trust, whether that has persisted in the uh, historically centralized parts of Uganda. Yeah, I think I just moved to the results here. And we, so we do not find a significant result for the ethnic-centric nationalism. But pre-colonial central, centralization is significantly, significantly correlated with a higher level of interpersonal trust. So, conclusion. Pre-colonial centralization is positively correlated with higher compliance norms. And this is explained by the legacy of first pre-colonial states' capacity in upholding authority, and second, a strong social cohesion through higher interpersonal trust, but not through trust in the central government and public institutions, such as the tax authority. So people in the historically centralized states are more obedient to political authority, which in turn shapes their compliance norm to general rules, including paying taxes. So mistrust in tax administration can coexist with a relatively high level of generalized trust. Policy implications, well, even though people in historically centralized parts of Uganda have mistrust towards the central government and public institutions, they may still be willing to follow rules and pay taxes when they live in a setting with higher interpersonal trust. Social and economic policies to increase trust in public institutions can therefore help to improve tax compliance in Uganda. 
And the success of such policies to improve trust in public institutions will, of course, depend on the leader's effort to acknowledge the past. And finally, Uganda was not the only uh, uh, country which had pre-colonial centralized state. You had it in Ghana with Ashanta, you have Greater Zimbabwe, you have in Senegal, West Africa, a number. So these results may also be of relevance for studies in other countries of Africa. Thank you so much.